Hey everyone, Anarch here. You know, when I was a teenager, I remember me and my friends had this thing we like to say anytime the subject turned to corruption in politics. It was something along the lines of, the most efficient system would be a benevolent dictator. You see, we thought the problem with a dictator wasn't the concentration of power itself, but instead the fact that the wrong dictator was sitting in the seat. We weren't the only ones who said that either. I've met plenty of people who posit the same thing to this day. Suffice to say, I have some thoughts about that. So let's have a talk about hierarchy. Hierarchy is a very old concept in humanity. Since our earliest records in Sumeria, we find the existence of a monarch. And although we should note that some other contemporary societies were not organized in that same way, it can't be denied that this mode of domination proliferated very successfully in the following years. But this doesn't mean that the mode was good. The most accurate statement that could be made was that it was successful at perpetuating itself. That a very bad system is good at perpetuating itself is not a virtue. This is, in fact, one of the biggest problems with power structures. Power structures inherently seek to perpetuate themselves. They seek to increase the amount of coercion they can inflict, as well as the number of subjects that their coercion can influence. This is an inherent fact about any power structure. But I don't expect you to just take me at my word without an argument, so let's go down the rabbit hole. When we come out the other side, we'll have some pretty handy tools for analysis, ones that we'll certainly be using on this channel in the future. So. Let's start at the bottom. We're going to define power in the following way. Power is the ability of some particular person or group of people to coerce the actions of another individual or group of individuals. A power structure is therefore a collection of human beings, or more typically some legal fiction which stands in for a group of humans, along with the ability to enact coercion. And although maybe back when humanity was in the Hobbesian state of nature, without extensive networks of cooperation, communication, and distribution, the predators in the wild would have been considered threats worth taking into account, we're the apex predator of the planet now, to a degree where we're destroying it with our excesses. So the only thing left to predate us is basically other humans and the brutal mechanics of the physical universe. In such a world, some people are bound to act in their perceived self-interest, even if we have to concede that individuals are not always the best arbiters of what that self-interest is. Let us just say that those who seek to act in their own self-interest have the motivation to carry out actions which could possibly be morally good or morally bad. I also think that selfish intent is one of the best ways to qualify an immoral action, but that conclusion comes about through a bunch of other stuff we're not going to talk about in this video. With just these conclusions, it's already obvious to note that power allows people to achieve their own self-interest more easily. And if power allows a person to attain their self-interest more easily, then those that are self-interested are going to be motivated to attain more power. Therefore, power structures will inherently allow powerful people to amass even more power. Power seeks to perpetuate itself. But if a power structure wants to perpetuate itself, when more than one power structure exists, they now have to compete with each other. Not only must they compete over the means to enforce coercion, but they must compete over the total number of subjects that can enact their will. It might be said then that power structures can be thought to have leverage over one another, depending on how much power they have to coerce one another. But what power structure really wants to compete with another power structure? Sure, corporations give lip service to this idea, but in practice they defy it the microsecond that they're given the opportunity. Historically, when private power structures are allowed to compete for long enough, and with as few regulations as they desire, they will all inherently seek to dominate the market, because that enacts their own perpetuation best. This is why monopolies arise in loosely regulated economic systems. Or take monarchies as an example. 
History shows in the countless wars of royal turmoil and the repeated redrawing of national boundaries in history that monarchs were no more tolerant of the existence of another power structure than a corporation. Many nations had periods in which their central powers would dissolve into many smaller power structures, all of which would violently vie for the re-perpetuation of their own central monopoly. Power seeks monopolization of power. Yet, the citizenry contains power in its sheer number, meaning that they are capable of exerting incredible potential coercion over all existing structures. For this reason, all power structures will inherently seek leverage over the citizenry. This can be seen in the existence of the state, which inherently exists to bolster its own power and the power of the upper class. At its core, this defines the process of building power. The selective partitioning of the citizenry into subjects and the slow diminishing of their potential to agitate for their own liberation or recourse. Or, as anarchist and historian Rudolf Rocker said, Every power presupposes some form of human slavery, for the division of society into higher and lower classes is one of the first conditions of its existence. The separation of men into castes orders, and classes occurring in every power structure corresponds to an inner necessity of the separation of the possessors of privilege from the people. These unchangeable facts of power dynamics produce an eternal antagonism between the masses and any power structure that arises. This antagonism leads to instability, struggle, and strife for the side who is the target of a structure's leverage. Where the power structure is allowed to control any facet of society, it will greedily seek the exploitation of that facet towards its ends. Thus, in order to reach stability, only one power structure can exist. But, because the populace is always a power in itself, the only possible way to orient society with one power structure is a unified power structure of the masses. This cannot be achieved through representatives, which are just a recreation of the coercive power dynamics and therefore an implicit recreation of the central antagonism. It can only be achieved through the direct determination of the masses. The creation of a power structure that is democratically determined by them, comprised of them, and delegated of themselves. A power structure where any position of authority is temporary, and whatever powers are given to that authority are minimized. This chain of logic, when applied as a framework, offers an enduring critique of any proposed power structure. To the degree that a power structure is not directly accountable to its subjects, it will operate at the expense of its subjects. This is what Frederick Douglass meant when he said, Find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have the exact measure of the injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them. With this framework set up, what about that original claim? way back at the beginning of the video. The idea that the most efficient system would be a benevolent dictator. Well, first, what does it mean for a system to be efficient? It seems that in this particular occasion it refers only to time minimization. For example, if a dictator on a whim ordered every factory worker to burn all of their products in a massive bonfire, would that be efficient? Is crashing your car into a wall efficient because it takes place in short order? When it comes to decision making, efficiency is minimizing error and maximizing progress toward the end goal of the group. The only thing that was efficient about the dictator's order was that it was carried out thoughtlessly. And that's not the only problem. If a hierarchical structure is the mechanism that determines what minimizes error and maximizes progress, by its very nature, it will make decisions that fit within the hierarchy's internal framework and the framework of the bureaucracy they're embedded inside of. This is exemplified in something called Conway's Law, which is a law for software development that says, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. With all of this in mind, the more stratified the organization that's making the decisions, 
the more it will tend to make decisions that are in the best interests of itself. And as decision making is further delegated away from the people being managed, context becomes more and more compressed, distorting the facts upon the ground and consequently making the decisions less efficient in a variety of ways that go completely unchecked and unrealized by those at the top of the hierarchy until the contradictions between their choices and the reality of outcomes become so thorough they have to confront them. This fact can be seen in every hierarchical system that is built. Take America's Republic, for example. In a study carried out by Cambridge called Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens, the researchers concluded Analysis indicates that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. government policy, while average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little or no independent influence. The results provide substantial support for theories of economic elite domination and for theories of biased pluralism, but not for theories of majoritarian electoral democracy or majoritarian pluralism. Punished for its foray into the half-authoritarianism of the Republic, America is degraded into something that is not even operationally a democratic republic. It's an oligarchy. This is because elected officials, having perpetuated their own power to its furthest extent, are now shielded from accountability through gerrymandering, lesser of two evils voting, and malicious campaign finance laws that have enabled them to establish extensive incumbencies and operationally ignore the expressed desires of their constituency. Said otherwise, in the absence of accountability, they affect their own interests. Or let us compare the hierarchical economic structure of the corporation to the more democratic economic structure of the co-op. In a study by the economist Virginia Perrotin called The Performance of Worker Cooperatives Versus Capitalist Firms, it was found that, contrary to popular thinking and to the pessimistic predictions of some theorists, solid, consistent evidence across countries, systems, and time periods shows that worker cooperatives are at least as productive as conventional firms and more productive in some areas. The more participatory cooperatives are, the more productive they tend to be. She goes on to say, Employment in a labor-managed firm is not the same thing as employment in a conventional one. In a labor-managed firm, members participate in the decisions that affect their unemployment and income risks. This makes it possible for worker cooperatives to adjust pay rather than employment in response to demand shocks. And... It can't be said that corporations have provided stable labor markets or stable economies either. The history of global capitalism is the history of repetitive boom-bust cycles that provide golden parachutes for the oligarchs and plunge the global populace into poverty and homelessness with almost zero democratic recourse. Corporations have been considered efficient based on an erroneous understanding of efficiency. Like the dictator who asked his factory workers to burn their products en masse. Instead of analyzing the actual ability to make effective decisions to weather economic downturns or to provide robust employment, capitalism has created a framework in which efficiency is reductively tied to generating profits for the owners of the business. For whom is such a system efficient? As Conway's law predicted, the owners of capital, not those over which it has power. The problem is not the constraints on the system, nor the actors inside of it. The capitalist entity is itself the failure point. You see, humanity is adaptable. We will adjust to the system and the social mores of the society we're placed in. If you create a system in which our dignity is fundamentally tied to the ability to dominate others, you'll create a society where humanity is transfigured into a dominator. There's no reason to continue preserving these fundamental antagonisms between the rulers and the ruled. The antagonisms are the brake on the engine of progress. They are the barrier between us and our better nature. 
So, no, the most efficient system would not be a benevolent dictator. In the very process of creating a system which had a dictator to begin with, society would be profoundly transfigured, such that its entire framework would be reimagined. All of its standards for achievement would be sycophantically altered, and the inherent antagonism that exists between the oppressors and the oppressed would remain staunch and unchanged. Hierarchy is not an effective way to manage society. Hierarchy is built to benefit the people at the top of the hierarchy. All progress in human history since the monarchs rose has been the abolition of unjust hierarchies and their slow replacement with forms of democratic recourse. Our future lies in the extension of that project, not its abandonment. If you watch till the end, thanks. If you'd like to support the work I'm doing here, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. As you can see, this channel is still really small and every single interaction makes a huge difference. Also, if you really like what I'm doing here, go become a patron at the Patreon link below. Anyway, see you around. Remember, there can be no justice when hierarchy reigns.